In high school English, I wrote what I thought was my crowning glory, an essay on F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby on the theme of expectations versus reality. It's a literary motif as old as time and pretty fitting considering the big fat B minus I received instead of my anticipated A. But a mismatch between how you think something will be and how it actually is doesn't just exist in lit class. In economics, we spend a lot of time modeling how we think things will go. When we look at the labor market, for example, and graph our supply and demand curves, we can see the spot where they meet, the spot which theoretically there are no open jobs and no unemployment either. But like finally winning the hand of a beautiful 1920s flapper, things aren't always as easy as they seem. And like the eyes of Dr. TJ Eckelberg, other forces hang over the labor market as a whole, influencing the exchange of money for labor beyond just the market forces you'd expect. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall, Macroeconomics. In many ways, the labor market acts a lot like other markets we're used to. We've got our supply, people who are looking for work, and our demand, businesses that are looking to hire. And since workers want to be paid more and firms want to pay less, these market forces drive pay rates to an equilibrium point, high enough that workers are willing to work, but still low enough for firms to be willing to pay. This rate is known as the equilibrium wage. At this equilibrium point, supply and demand would be perfectly balanced. So everyone has a job who wants one, and there aren't any empty postings left up on Indeed. But the fact is, there are some reasons for employers to pay more than equilibrium wages, which makes the reality of our labor market look pretty different from our graphical expectations. And there are lots of macro level benefits that come with paying employees more. Beyond the obvious excitement of maybe finally being able to pay off my student loans, Having more people with higher paying jobs and therefore the ability to not only spend big, but invest big too, is really good for the economy as a whole, bumping production and economic potential. But like everything in economics, it comes with an opportunity cost. If there's a whole bunch of people getting paid more than the equilibrium wage, you might have a bunch of folks unemployed too, because firms only have so much money to spend on employees. But like we've already established, in the real world, things don't always turn out the way economists predict they will. There are specific things that can set wages higher than the natural equilibrium rate, which could lead to a bump in unemployment. One important example of wage intervention are the minimum wage laws. These laws make it so that employers are required to pay their workers at least a certain amount per hour in exchange for their labor to help prevent worker exploitation. Federal minimum wage laws in the U.S. came about during the Great Depression, when nearly 25% of the labor force was out of work, and therefore ripe for exploitation by whatever job they could get their hands on. In the U.S. today, federal minimum wage isn't actually enough to live off of in most of the country, and the vast majority of workers actually make more than that. But in certain industries with really high labor supply, like the performing arts, firms have a huge amount of potential labor and could theoretically start hiring for almost nothing or even actually nothing. Exposure isn't worth anything in an economics course. In that case, minimum wage laws are supposed to help prevent exploitation of workers by ensuring they're paid more fairly, at least in theory. Don't worry, corporations still have plenty of other ways to exploit the labor force. But minimum wage laws can also set the wages higher than the equilibrium rate. And some people worry that'll make firms hire less. Maybe one person at $14 an hour instead of two people at $7 an hour. Still. Minimum wage laws don't actually affect unemployment as much as you'd think. This is something economists bicker back and forth about because it's really hard to test. There's never been a large enough increase in minimum wage to really see how the model plays out in the real world. But generally, it seems that upping minimum wage slightly doesn't create the kind of unemployment we all fear. But it does have the potential for significant positive impact on the lives of workers. To see a case study of the effects of minimum wage, we can look at our neighbor to the south. In 2012, the Mexican government raised the minimum wage in only part of the country. The people living in that section benefited from higher wages, allowing some families to break the cycle of poverty. There didn't seem to be any effect on employment rates between the different areas with their different minimum wages either. In fact, those who worked in the region with higher minimum wage were actually more likely to stay employed for longer, though larger and more generalized impacts are more ambiguous. So 
At first, we might expect minimum wage to really influence the labor market. But in reality, much of the time, its effects are like the chance of a happy ending for Daisy and Gatsby. Fairly minimal. But minimum wage laws aren't the only force intersecting with supply and demand in the labor market. Similar to minimum wage, unions can also drive up worker pay beyond equilibrium wages. Unions work in a variety of ways, but at their heart, they bring workers together to successfully bargain with firms on wages, benefits, and other rights. So maybe Cody is working for $13 an hour at a factory and asks for a $2 an hour raise, threatening to quit if he doesn't get it. The threat of just Cody leaving isn't bad enough to persuade the factory owner to raise his wage. He knows he could find someone else to work for $13 an hour if Cody quits. So he denies the request. But if Cody is part of a union with the rest of his coworkers and they collectively demand a raise, the owner's answer might sound a little different. The union might threaten to strike or completely stop working until their request is met, which would completely disrupt production. Suddenly, the opportunity cost of not raising wages isn't losing a single employee, but the cost of underused machinery in an idle factory that still has utility and rent payments, plus the loss of all profit from sales. The firm has to decide between an expensive strike or just paying the better wages. But that money for those higher wages has to come from somewhere. And by somewhere, we mean anywhere but the CEO's own paycheck. So sometimes firms might close factories or initiate layoffs in order to afford their higher paid workforce. Of course, being in a union is a trade-off for employees too. Union members on strike have to give up weeks of pay and unless they live in New York or New Jersey, can't file for unemployment, at least as of 2024. Ultimately, union participation is linked to lower wage gaps and increased equality. Successful union strikes have scored big wins for Hollywood actors and writers and auto workers and post office employees, among many others. But sometimes businesses decide to pay their employees better than the equilibrium wage, not because someone is forcing their hand, but because it's actually better for them. These higher than average wages for a given industry are known as efficiency wages, paid by a firm because of the benefits they get from having the best wages in the biz. It might seem counterintuitive, but as the theory goes, it can actually save employers money to raise pay rates because simply being the highest paying employer in the area gets you some serious benefits. It's not altruism, it's just good business. Matt's Magic Balloons is a local high quality balloon manufacturing company and they make the best balloons. In a highly competitive market where plenty of low quality knockoffs are available for lower prices, Matt's Magic Balloons is always trying to figure out how to keep ahead of the competition so they can continue making their premium products. The uh, devilishly handsome proprietor decides to pay more and offer better benefits than the industry standard for every position in his company. It's a huge expense, but it ends up being worth it to help him avoid many of the problems that plague his competitors. Like, he notices at industry conferences that other businesses and owners are constantly complaining about their workers calling out sick. But Matt doesn't have the same problem because his higher wages and healthcare benefits help his workers take care of their health. They spend a lot less time calling out sick and a lot more time blowing up balloons. The higher wages at Matt's Magic Balloons also mean his balloon smiths are on average more productive than those workers at those other balloon houses, turning in more high quality work more quickly. While some competitors complain that new designs take forever to make and approve and factory workers produce only a few bags of balloons a day, Matt knows his teams are constantly trying to figure out ways to generate a better product in less time. That's because Matt's higher pay attracts the best and brightest in the balloon making industry. And once they're there, they feel valued by their employer. They love Matt and they love working for him. As a result, they consistently do their best work to support Matt's magic balloons so they don't have to go work for those penny-pinching alternative employers. Matt also hears his colleagues in the balloon industry talk about how many middle managers they need to keep their factories operating smoothly. But at Matt's magic balloons, there's only one manager besides Matt himself to supervise employees and coach them through issues, help them make the best balloon elephant on the block, and generally make sure everything's running as it should be and one is all he needs. The higher wages means there's less employee turnover, so he doesn't need an army of managers to train new workers and supervise his team to make sure everything's running smoothly. Matt's colleagues don't understand how he can pay so well, but at this point, he's not sure how he could afford not to. But in the end, on top of paying his employees really well and making the best balloons in the biz, 
According to efficiency wage theory, Matt's probably gonna provide fewer jobs than his competitors. He doesn't need as many employees because those he's got are so good. And because he's paying them at a higher rate, he couldn't afford to hire more anyway. That's because efficiency wages are another break from the market force enforced equilibrium wage, which means it could theoretically bump up unemployment along with employee pay. The idea that wage rates and unemployment and labor markets would work the same as prices for goods and services is just too simplistic. Important considerations like minimum wage laws, unions, and efficiency wages all drive wages up and mess with market forces. But we can't always predict how these outside forces will influence our world. Like how it might seem minimum wage laws would push unemployment through the roof when in reality, that's not what we see in life. Economics is the science of scarcity and the labor market is no different. There are only so many workers, only so many jobs and only so much money. And when there's scarcity, you know that there are going to be some trade-offs. And while that isn't the only thing influencing unemployment rates, it is one factor switching up the market forces you'd expect to see. In the end, Scarcity is one of the only constants in economics. Like Gatsby pining for the green light across the lake, we all yearn for more time and more money and more jobs and more prohibition era champagne smuggled across the Canadian border. So even when the economy doesn't behave exactly how we'd expect on paper, we can always depend on scarcity to underpin economic decisions. And so we beat on. Workers against the economy, born back ceaselessly into unemployment, or something. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you wanna help us out, give this video a like, uh, comment if you read The Great Gatsby in school and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.